Okay, so I'm super excited to be here. We're going to be talking today about building your product management, product manager uh, career. We're also going to talk a little bit about designing products, how to bring these uh, products to life for your customers, um, a little bit about product analytics and tools. Um, but I'm hoping for a very lively conversation, and um, why don't we just get started? So. I thought I'd start with a, a quick and easy one. It's a warm up. So can you each tell me a little bit about your journey into product management? As we all know, product managers often come from a diverse set of backgrounds and experiences. Some come from engineering, design, marketing. Uh, we've worked on many different kind of areas. Um, some comes right out of uh, business school. So tell me a little bit about your journey into product management. And why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so, I was originally an electrical engineer at Stanford. Um, I think I know some of the stories here. I think what's a little bit different is that when I was coming out of school, product management was actually really popular. Mm -hmm. And so, I still didn't know what it was, but I knew that it was something that um, was kind of the intersection of business and technology, and it was something I wanted to eventually get into. But I think for some of the aspiring product managers here, you probably know that it's kind of hard to find on-ramps into product management. So when I came out of um, Stanford, I ended up going to Accenture and worked in their technology labs. That to me was also kind of a nice mix of doing some consulting. It was the R&D group within Accenture, so I also got to do some coding, spent a few years there, and then um, really felt like I wanted to work on an actual product. Mm -hmm. um, Accenture is definitely more of a services company, and you could, you could see that in some of the ways they prioritized their, their work. And um, actually had a challenging time trying to figure out what that next step was going to be, because a lot of startups in Silicon Valley don't necessarily value a consulting background. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up um, running into a very small company called Circle of Moms, had 14 people. They invented a role for me, actually, called a marketing and analytics engineer that was on the engineering team. So I reported to the CTO, but I was kind of the liaison to marketing, and I was responsible for driving user engagement, so basically how many page views and clicks we could get on the site. Spent about nine months there, and then was reached out to by Workday, which is where I've been for the last seven years. Um, and that's where I got my first real product management role. Um, I worked on their collaboration technology and then just kind of, I would say my career took off from there. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, my, uh, my undergrad is actually a science degree, so I'm technically a scientist. Okay. And um, when I was at <coughs> university to earn some money during the breaks, I used to do market research. So I would stand on streets and ask people like random questions. And um, I remember asking, we were doing this study for Budweiser about labels and packaging. And I remember thinking, someone must have thought about these questions. Like, why are they asking these questions? And, uh, and, that, and then the whole world of marketing came to me. And I was tired of working in a lab and wearing the lab coat the whole time. So I decided to move into marketing. Not because it was a product thing, but because I was really interested in why people made decisions on stuff. And, um, you know, of course, one of the P's of marketing is product. So I spent um, 20 years uh, doing CPG uh, marketing and product. Uh, I spent a lot of time in factories making physical things to put on physical shelves to sell people. And uh, after about 20 years of that, I am um, kind of uh, I figured, you know, I wonder if I'm really learning as much as I can. And, um, and at the time, I got a call from MasterCard. And, um, and I said to them, look, you know, I think you've called the wrong person. I don't have any financial services experience. Like, I've never worked in a bank. And they said, uh, no, 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 we want someone with consumer experience. And tell us about your product experience. And that's not the way that consumer packaged goods think about it. They don't call it product. They call it brand management. So I said, what do you mean? What do you mean this product thing? What do you mean? But um, the reality is, is that it's, it's, there are huge parallels between marketing and what you do in the P of your five P's of marketing and how to bring that into product. So, um, so I took that into a payments environment. And uh, yeah, it's been a real sort of moment of learning how transferable skills can be 
across different industries. You know, you can use the same, same philosophy and same principles. Um, well, I'll start by calling out that um, I was very fortunate to be presented with an opportunity to get into product uh, fairly early in my career and have not looked back since. But my story really starts when I graduated college with um, the highly monetizable degree in comparative literature, <laughs> got on a bus, moved to New York. Um, I think I had ideas of working in publishing, but very quickly I realized that my priority needs to be to make money to pay rent. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up um, kind of figuring out like, all right, what, what is really important to me um, to find in a company? Because I clearly don't know exactly what I'm going to you know, turn into my career. Um, and a couple of things I knew were, I knew I wanted to be somehow in a tech -y space. I didn't know what that meant, but that's what I wanted. And I knew I wanted to be in a small company because not knowing exactly what I wanted to do, I, I kind of put it together that in a smaller company, there should just be easier access to other people and other teams, and I could start talking to them and figuring out what are the sort of career options out there. Um, so I, I ended up taking a job in customer service in a tech startup. And uh, I think in that regard, my, my story is actually relatively common of, of going from customer service to product because being on the proverbial front lines and, and actually talking to customers all day, I found myself unable to answer um, frustrated questions like, why on earth does it work like that? <laughs> um, and so I would try and go find the answer within my company because clearly somebody made a decision, uh, deliberate or not. That depends, but somebody made a decision. And these inquiries um, inevitably led me to talk to people with this job title called product. Um, so after several months of me constantly going and pestering the product team, um, a position opened up for an associate uh, product manager, and, and they were open to internal candidates. So I'd gone to speak to my, my manager in customer service and to ask for her support in applying for the position. And uh, I had a whole spiel prepared for like why I'm going to be great for this position, and she should help me get this opportunity. And she just cut me off and said, I've already submitted your resume. I see what's yeah. happening here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, I, I actually, uh, the, when the job posting was open, they were calling it associate product manager, which I think is a pretty common title. But um, I forget how this came about, but my actual official job title for the first six months ended up being apprentice product manager, which I loved because I think it is a craft. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and yeah, the, the rest of this is, is history. A lot of learning on the job, um, finding mentors, finding people I can learn from, some product people, but also engineers and marketers and every kind of person that can be involved in delivering a valuable product to the market. I always love asking that question because if I, as I look around the room, everybody here is a product manager. We have all have our stories and our journey. I have mine as well, mm -hmm. right? Because when I first started, product management wasn't so common. It wasn't a term. In fact, the closest thing that I could think of uh, that was what was uh, how you focus on the customers, how do you solve problems for those customers, are you really fulfilling a need or creating value mm -hmm. for those customers? Um, and the closest thing at the time was marketing. Product marketing mm -hmm. was, was a term. General management mm -hmm. or general manager was also. And so as I've seen this, this, this profession and this function developed, um, it's just, it's been amazing to watch over the years and also the way different companies, the way different organizations, uh, and even within an organization, product managers do different things, but they're always solving a, a customer problem at the end of the day or, or fulfilling a customer, uh, customer need. And so I, I, I open the question up to the panel as you think about just, you know, the, the over sort of long arching, you know, uh, arc of, of product management. What do you mm -hmm. think are some of the ways that we can continue to advance this profession? Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the biggest changes you think we could, we could make, the critical changes that we can make to kind of continue that paradigm? Uh, and then especially, again, for, for women in product, uh, as we are all um, kind of pushing ourselves through um, and, and making sure that we're, we're, we're representing the customer voice, the customer need, and really delivering that value. Mm -hmm. I, I can start. I mean, I, to, to me, it's actually more around creating more on-ramps into product management, mm -hmm. because that's something I personally felt like I, I, I ran up against quite a bit in the beginning. And um, it's also not advice that it's like, okay, once you become a VP, then you can like figure out how to do on-ramps. So my second year in at Workday, I told my boss, 
hey, we should think about doing an associate program because I have so many friends who I think could be great product managers, but all our roles listed out there are like product manager of like this very specific area requiring you know, deep technical expertise in that domain. Um, and he was very supportive. Like, I just literally wrote up a proposal. We started the program with two people in that first year, and it's grown since then. Mm -hmm. And so I just think finding more ways to, to let people have the opportunity to try out the product management skill at an entry level is, is really important. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll build on that because, you know, once they're in, then I think that the, the opportunity is probably one word, which is collaboration. Mm -hmm. Because I think product is, it can be a bit of a black box. What one company calls product is different to what a, another company calls product. And it takes a village to bring something to market. So there's never any one person that can do it. So I think the power is in figuring out who around you you can collaborate with to make sure that that happens. You can have a bunch of engineers running sprints, which is great. You can have a load of analysts pulling data, which is great. The magic comes when they come together and they say, right, OK, I've figured out this, and this is how we could do it, and this will probably work, and I've knew this before, and, and let me apply this learning. I think that that's the magic, is that collaboration. and. I'm just going to say this, particularly for women, because I think we are natural collaborators. So I think that there is a, there's an energy that we can bring to this mm -hmm. that really stitches this whole thing together to take it from being something like, you know, I have an idea, it's just me, this one idea, to something that can really drive a purposeful change in the marketplace because you've brought many people together. I love that. Okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. As product managers, we often think about trends. We look at data, we look at uh, what customers are doing, we do usability studies, user research, we're paying really close attention to what our competitors are or potentially what open new spaces are uh, available to us. Um, when you, so we, when we were talking earlier uh, as we were prepping for this panel, you talked about your disruption radar right. um, as, as, as a way to look for those trends. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and how you think about it as you're, yeah. as you're really building sort of the products for today, maintaining the products of yesterday, and then thinking about what products to bring to market in the future. Right. So who here is working in the tech space? OK, like a lot of you. <laughs> and <laughs> um, you know, our industries are changing. Um, the consumer is empowered. Uh, you know, there are all of these things. Disruption is going to happen. Okay? Now, the question is, is, are you the disruptor or are you being the one that is being disrupted? So um, I, I think it, the way that I sort of think about this is I boil it down to two questions. The first question is really spend some time defining what are you in the business of? Okay. So for example, and you know I, I'm speaking as a naive observer, but you know if I'm the if I'm in the business of Stitch Fix, right? Am I in the business of um, uh, you know, personal shopping, or am I in the business of uh, you know data that really helps me drive my style and helps me to stand out? I don't know if there's anybody from Stitch Fix here. <laughs> okay, right, that's probably a good thing. Um, <laughs> one person. <laughs> um, but it matters, right? Because the competition. If I'm a personal shopping service, my competition might be Bloomingdale's. If I'm a data company that is all about helping create style and stand out, maybe my competitor is Instagram. I don't, I'm making it up. But so to firstly define what you're in the business of. And then uh, once you've done that, define who is your competition. And I'll give you an example of something that I learned um, in one of my CPG um, examples was I used to work on a business that uh, was a product that helped people stop smoking. And we said, OK, who's the competition? Right, The competition is the other brands in the market that help people stop smoking. But when you actually ask the consumer what they do, 
to perform that function. They said, well, when I'm stopping smoking, what I do is I buy teeth whiteners and I drink coffee a lot more. So actually we decided that you know, the category wasn't just about the brand competition, it was all of the other things that the consumer said. Now the reason why I think that's important is because uh, I'm not saying that you know, like, the uh, crest are gonna suddenly turn into you know, quit smoking products, it's unlikely to happen. But what it does is it gives you a sense of where your permission to play is. And that can help you be the disruptor in the marketplace. Uh, on the flip side, you know, maybe there are those periphery players that are sort of waiting in the wings to take your business. Stay aware of those because they may come in and disrupt your business. So I use that as a way of sort of flipping to becoming how do you be the disruptor and also understanding where your, dis where your disruption could come from. Thank you. So let's let's talk a little bit about user experience. Um, anybody focus on consumers and user experience, sort of uh, design. I assume people have design philosophies. Um, if you look at sort of Google products versus Apple products, right? The design philosophies are often different, um, but they all sort of are deeply rooted in a in an understanding of the consumers of what they um, what problem that they want to solve, what you want to solve. Um, and I, I often look at different design philosophies um, by, by a person or by an organization, um, and then obviously judged by, by its products. Um, and so, Selena, you talked a little bit about um, you know, your design principles or design philosophies. Can you share a little bit about that? Because it, it really is different uh, for different people, but also for different organizations. And then whether you're trying to solve something for a B2B product or a B2C product, so can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let me try to sort of summarize my point of view and then give you two examples. Um, I, I like to think that I take a, a human-centric uh, approach to my design philosophy, um, which is you, you're building a product to be used by a person. Um, and so I kind of challenge that, like, B2B, B2C, none of that really matters as you're building mm -hmm. for people. Mm -hmm. And the job of the design is to meet the user's need. And the design does that, or it doesn't do that. And in fact, when it does that well, often the product design is almost sort of invisible, right? Because it doesn't get in the way of what the user is trying to do. Um, and um, the, we, we sometimes confuse um, sort of our broader understanding of visual arts, where aesthetics is, are very important, uh, with this discipline of product design. The designer's job is not to design something that looks pretty to you, or to the VP of marketing, or to the executive stakeholder that you're working with. The job is to design something that solves the user's need. Um, secondly, there are still multiple ways to design something that solves the user's need. So taste does matter. Um, and taste in this context is not this sort of like innate ephemeral thing that only, you know, especially talented designers are born with. Taste is totally something that you can learn. And much more importantly, your customer's taste is what you need to understand, and that is totally solvable. Um, you can look at other products that they use beyond even the scope of, you know, are they competitors or, or even like comparators to you? Um, what are the products that they use constantly, right? It might be Facebook. You're not doing anything to compete with Facebook or to, or to you know, compete with any part of what Facebook does maybe. But if your users are using Facebook, then Facebook is in part what's setting their expectations on what good usability looks like and what, what aesthetics they find pleasing, right? So, so find out what your customers think looks nice and works well. Remember, you are not the customer. The design needs to work well for the customer. And I'll say one thing that's incredibly valuable to invest into, a skill that's valuable to, to invest into early on in your career, is how to give uh, productive feedback to your design partners. Um, you know, the, there's sort of like a joke, right, where you, you say, you know, can you make it pop more? And like, we kind of laugh, and it's like, ha, 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 yeah, that's a terrible way to give feedback. But in reality, we do continue to give terrible feedback every time that we tell our designer, like, I think the button should be red, or like, can you make this bigger, right? Like, your job is not to propose a solution. Let the designer do their job. They're the expert at that. Your job is to figure out how to articulate why you think the proposed design does or does not meet the user's needs based on what you know about that user. And to, and to articulate that feedback and then, like I said, let the designer do their job. So two quick examples. Um, in uh, weddings, so the knot, we help people plan the, the wedding of their dreams. And so when it comes to uh, you know, the, the visual experience, 
It's the weddings themselves that are beautiful. That's what people want to see. They want to garner inspiration into what they might want to do for their wedding, right? So they want pictures of varieties of venues, one venue set up in different ways or different layouts, lots of pictures of details, dresses, flowers, makeup, hair, accessories, uh, T table settings, I mean, the, end, the list is endless. And so what we really want is we want those images to shine and let our user interface really be a canvas for it. Um, a different example that's a little bit more broad and, and not so industry specific is if you're designing for mobile apps, um, you're pretty much designing for multiple but very short interactions. Um, one sort of challenge that I like to, that I like to put um, uh, the design to the test for is imagining the user trying to do something with one thumb while crossing the street and kind of like keeping an eye on the traffic. I do and, that all the time. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think like that, you know, seeing if, if the primary action can be accomplished in that way will force you to make the primary call to action clear on the page more than any school of design philosophy or aesthetics or style or what the VP of marketing thinks. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just add a point about this B2B and B2C thing? Yeah. So I saw this great um, sort of infographic once, and it said, there is no B2B or B2C. It is only H to H, mm -hmm. human to human. And I just think that that's a good way of cutting through the... I love that because in the end, yeah. you still have a customer, a real person, a human at the end of your product. Yes. Yeah. Um, so quick show of hands, how many of you have mentors out there? How many of you have sponsors? Okay, so that's really interesting. Let me, let me talk a little bit about that. So mentors often act as an advocate for you. They, they provide, they're an advisor. They can help you as a sounding board as you're navigating you know, this job, uh, a particular problem that you're having, how to work with engineers a little bit better. Um, they could be inside the organization that you work at, sometimes they're outside of the organization, sometimes they're your manager uh, or prior manager. Sponsors, on the other hand, are people who have um, direct influence within your organization. They can help you get promoted, they can help you get raises, and they sort of work almost behind the scenes to help push you up. Um, and so, Aaron, you talked a lot about having a sponsor uh, at Workday help you. And so I, I was wondering if you could uh, tell the audience, one, about that experience, how, how your sponsor helped you, and then specifically for the audience out here who don't have sponsors, how they might be able to attract one. Yeah. Um, and when I, I, I don't think I realized I had a sponsor until I think I read an HBS article that define the difference between mm -hmm. a mentor or a sponsor. So I was pretty lucky to just um, happen to, to develop one. And I would say it started actually before I even started at Workday because it was the hiring manager that, um, that had reached out to me. And the backstory is actually that I had applied to Workday coming out of Accenture. You remember I went to another place in between, but I had applied, I applied everywhere when I was leaving <laughs> Accenture. And I think I applied as a designer, a developer, and a PM. So it was just you know, putting myself out there in any sort of role that would directionally get me toward product management. And he, at the time, ran both the PM and the design team. And he remembered my resume from when I had submitted it nine months prior as a designer and thought of me when a role popped up for product management and actually reached out to me there. So he was already kind of identifying the potential that he thought I had that I wasn't even sure that I had myself. And that's where, like, the way I would define the sponsor role is someone who recognizes the potential that you have, but then also can give you opportunities to reach that potential. And so some of the examples of things that he did, um, he, would, he would find ways to get me more visibility. So you know, within, I think, three to four months of starting at Workday, I had to present to our CEO on our collaboration strategy. And I didn't think I was ready, but he's like, no, I think you can do it. He gave me advice on what I should present, how I should present it, and really guided me in that way. Um, and then within two years, he was switching roles within the company, and he said, look, Aaron, I'm, I'm, I'm designating you as my successor. And I think like many um, women tend to do, I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not ready. Um, I'm still one of the most junior PMs on the team. Like, Why would you even think that I can manage this team? I've only managed like two people before. Um, and this is the whole technology product team. But he said, look, I think you can do it. I'm going to 
coach you. I'm still going to be here. Um, and so I said, OK. And it really pushed me much faster than I even thought I could go. And I think that's exactly the, the role you want a sponsor to be playing for you. But I would say that the, the most valuable thing that he did as a sponsor was sort of alert me to and guide me around the political dynamics of the company. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think gets underestimated because I think you hear politics, a lot of women in particular hear politics, and you're like, I just don't want to get involved in that, and I'm going to be, um, I'm going to abstract myself from that and kind of pretend those don't exist. But to me, it's less about like playing games of politics, but it's more around just understanding what is driving different groups or different leaders, what they're motivated by, and then being able to use that to like message what you're trying to get done and make sure it resonates with those people. Mm -hmm. And that was advice that was really helpful from him. He'd, he'd tell me, like, this specific person is actually the decision maker in the room, even if their title is not. Um, these people are particularly influential on technical decisions. This is the group you really want buy-in on if you're trying to get this project out the door. Mm -hmm. And so that's actually something that I think you could probably get from a mentor or a sponsor, but for me, that was the most valuable thing that I got out of my sponsor. And so in terms of like, how do you find one if you don't have one, um, I do think it's easiest if it's someone in your management chain because this, this has to be a mutually beneficial relationship. And that's what happened with me and my manager in that he would give me a project, I would deliver on it, and it would make him look good as well. And so it made him then more likely to give me something else, something bigger, and it just kind of grew from there. And so I would advise you to look kind of first within your own management chain, mm -hmm. someone who can is close enough to see the work that you're doing, but also be um, positively impacted if you do something good, and to ask for some small projects where you can demonstrate that you can exceed um, the expectations and make them look good as well. Yeah, yeah, I'll just, and I, you know, I, you, heard, you, you said a few things about, you know, they're working for you behind the scenes, and not many of you guys raised your hands when we spoke about sponsors, and my guess is many of you have got sponsors, but you might just, you might just not know about it. Because mm -hmm. there might be someone who's advocating for you, um, because often it is invisible, which is a kind of weird thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how do you manage this sponsor when it's sort of an invisible person? Um, so the way that I sort of, um, I think about that is, you know, to, to Aaron's point about, um, it, it's not necessarily about politics. I think you have to, we have to shift the dynamic from about being a political player to being someone who is actively navigating a career. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a slightly different thing, but it's, it's, a, more, it's a more active, purposeful thing. So, um, you know, I think the way to go about that is, firstly, really spend some time thinking about where are you trying to get to? And that's not always an easy thing to answer, but it's an important one because if you do have that sponsor behind you, you want to make sure that she or he is putting you forward for the job that you want. Because the worst thing is to get the job that you don't want. Right? You want the job that you want. So, um, so figure out like where is that direction that I'm trying to get to. Um, and then um, I, I sort of think of this like a map. Um, you know, right? I say I've, I've defined what my destination is. Then who are the stakeholders? Forget about sponsors and mentors and all the rest of it for a second. But who are the stakeholders that can be the roads that will help me get to that destination? Be really active about who your stakeholders are. Physically write a list. Put time in your calendar to go and see these people once every whatever. Really be active on it. And it feels awkward and uncomfortable because you'll ask to go and have coffee with somebody and you won't really have anything to talk about. But the, my, the single biggest thing you can do there is just say, please, can you give me some advice? Because by asking for advice, you are basically recruiting them to your cause. Because if they give you some, a piece of information and you do it, you've executed their plan, right? So that's a good thing. It helps you to bring your, your stakeholders with you. And then uh, as you go through that, you're probably going to find that you know, you've got natural chemistry with some people. Um, and those are the ones to really lean in on. 
Um, because if that is a stakeholder who you've got good chemistry with and has got a pathway to take you to the direction that you want to go, that is, that's a magic moment. So, um, but the point is that you have to earn, you have to earn the right to stay on their mental radar. You know, it can't be a, hey, will you be my sponsor? That's, you know, not, not the, that's not the way to think about it. It's that how do I earn the right to be your sponsee? Is that the word? <laughs> I don't sure. know. Yeah, we'll go with it. We'll go with it. Um, so, I, so I sort of use that sort of mapping analogy. Yeah, I love that. Um, I, I, I certainly had a sponsor. It wasn't my direct management train, but a, a peripheral. And uh, she, she left, the co left the company, and what she, what she told me was, I helped pull you up, make sure you pull the next yeah, people right. up. So that's just one thing that really stuck in, in, uh, in my head, because as you find sponsors, or if you, if you get a sponsor, or lucky enough to have a sponsor help you, you know, make, make sure you pass that, yeah. pass that down. Um, we, we only have a couple of minutes, so I just wanted to open it up to the audience. I have more questions, but if anybody had a question that they wanted to ask these fantastic ladies, um, please feel free to raise your hand and, and we'll call upon you. Quiet group. <laughs> okay, um, all right, well we have, why don't I ask one last question, and it's actually around, uh, specifically again, as, as I think about uh, building products, right? We talked about design. We talked about uh, managing your stakeholders. We talked about really solving the customer problem. The last thing we didn't touch upon was data and data analytics and how you use that to either inform your decisions about the product or even potentially how you influence your stakeholders. Um, and so the, the question is, is really around how do you use it and what are the common mistakes that you have seen uh, throughout your career or, or the biggest mistake that you've seen for data? Mm -hmm. Um, I'd love to, to take this one. Um, I, I'd start off by saying just in simplest, sort of plain English terms, you're trying to figure out how to make your product better. That means that currently it is not good enough at meeting some customer needs. So you start by asking, okay, well given my product as it is today and my customer needs, what do people do today? How many of them do it? And why do they do the things that they do? Right? So there's the what and the why. The what you're going to answer quantitatively. That's your deep data analysis, or if you're trying to understand um, not uh, actual behavior but intent, then you might be doing surveys to understand what your customers prefer. And the why is going to come from the qualitative, the one-on-one -on -one interviews, the usability testing, where you can really understand like what is the reasoning and the motivation that gets the user to use your product the way they do today. And you absolutely always have to have both the what and the why. If you have the what, you're going to waste cycles trying to solve a problem without having a clue as to why it's not working well enough today. Similarly, you might find a why that you're like, oh my god, this is such a painful problem for, a bun for my customers, and I think I can solve it. We should totally do it. You might be solving a problem for two customers instead of for the other 98. Um, and since we're always trying to do the most valuable thing possible for the greatest majority of our customers, in that case, we'd be doing something wrong. Yeah. So the what and the why, that's the quant and the, and the qual coming together. One thing I'll say about the misconceptions is um, there's this, especially as it became really easy to collect and store data, there's this misconception that like, if you just amass data and, and do enough pivot tables that like, somehow patterns will emerge and just jump at you. And that's never the case. It really isn't. Because the way that you collect the data shapes the data, and that in turn shapes what you're going to learn from the data. So please be disciplined. Start with a hypothesis, and then ask yourself, if this hypothesis is true, then what is both observable, and what must be both observable and true of my customer's behavior, and how can I find out you know, what, whether the data is going to confirm or, or disconfirm that? Great. Well, thank you. So we're out of time, but again, you know, some of the great things about being a product manager is you are at the forefront, you are the most collaborative, you're bringing in the engineers, the designers, the marketers, your, your leadership team, as well as everybody in between. Um, and there's so many tools at your disposal, whether it's data or design or um, market research surveys, all of these are just different tools. And there's so many frameworks out there that can help define and influence because a lot of times as product managers, you don't actually have anybody reporting to you. Um, and so you have to influence and you have to be able to communicate uh, the customer need and then, and then the, ultimately the solution. Um, and then as you are navigating your career, um, you know, again, 
seek mentors, uh, attract sponsors, but a lot of it is just, you know, being badass and uh, <laughs> building good, good products uh, for your users. So thank you, and thank you, ladies, for, uh, for joining me today.